So good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning. My name is Meg Beyer. I am part of the Managed Care Technical Assistance, or MCTAC, team at the McSilver Institute at, here at NYU. I'm really thrilled to be joined today by a few of our state partner colleagues who are going to present on our webinar. Today's webinar is really talking about meeting the behavioral health crisis needs in the community, specifically as it relates to the Medicaid Managed Care Crisis Intervention Benefit. Um, and so we're going to talk specifically about mobile crisis, the mobile crisis component, and technical assistance. Um, a few logistics about today. This webinar is being recorded, so the recording and the slides will be posted to the MCTAC website, as, as well as circulated to everyone who's joining us today via email. We are going to take questions throughout the webinar. We'll collect them throughout the webinar, and then we'll save time at the end to answer questions. So if you have any questions that pop up throughout the presentation, you don't have to hold off until the end. You can chat them in using the chat box functionality that it should be located on the right-hand lower side of your screen. Um, and if you do have any questions that are more related to logistics, we would ask that you just chat them in to the host. You'll see there's a drop-down option. Um, and our wonderful host, uh, Tara, who's working the back end of the webinar, can try and help you remedy whatever issue might be going on. So with that, I also want to thank uh, Chris Smith and Denise Balzer, who are going to be our presenters this morning, for leading us through the content. And with that, I'm going to ask Denise um, to get us started with the agenda. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for joining our technical assistance webinar for the mobile crisis component of the Managed Care Crisis Intervention Benefit. Um, we'll, we're going to begin by reviewing the vision for the behavioral health crisis services in New York State, mobile crisis services within the benefit, strategies for obtaining insurance information, backroom issues, resources, and questions at the end of our um, webinar. Next slide. To begin, um, the vision of a comprehensive behavioral health crisis response system began with the transition of Medicaid into managed care. We had conversations with state agencies, local governments, hospitals, community organ organizations, providers, and consumers that resulted in a vision that integrates existing state and local crisis infrastructure with newly available Medicaid resources along with district funds and grant-funded projects. Uh, behavioral health crisis response services should be available to all New Yorkers regardless of age and the ability to pay. County mental health directors worked with the state to create county and our regional crisis response plans that were shared with the state that identified providers eligible to be reimbursed through Medicaid managed care crisis intervention benefit. And these plans are currently being used as a starting point for ongoing crisis response planning throughout the state. Next slide. The objectives of the mobile crisis services can be achieved through a network of providers or a single agency. Um, it needs to include the capacity to respond to behavioral health crisis for adults, adolescents, and children. Um, at rapid access to appropriate levels of follow-up care is critical for the stabilization and ongoing support and treatment of individuals needing crisis services. For Medicaid recipients, data sharing and mobile access to medical history can be accessed through Psyches, and we'll discuss Psyches um, later in the webinar. The development of effectiveness of all of these tools will be ongoing through um, electronic health records and communication for mobile crisis teams with their providers. Peer supports are critical uh, in the uh, delivery of crisis services. Consumers of crisis services shared with us during our uh, beginning conversations that this type of engagement is preferred. There are multiple initial, excuse me. There are multiple initiatives such as crisis intervention training, mental health first aid, 
that are bringing together law enforcement, first responders, and mobile crisis providers for more effective interventions with the goal of reducing unnecessary hospitalization, incarceration, and or ER visits. Next slide. The crisis intervention benefit um, is authorized under the 1115 waiver as a demonstration benefit. This uh, benefit is available to Medicaid managed care enrollees. The purpose of this benefit is to provide adult or children who are experiencing imminent risk at experiencing behavioral health crisis with services throughout the state. Um, next slide. The services that are included under this crisis intervention benefit include telephonic triage and response, mobile crisis response, telephonic crisis follow-up, and mobile crisis follow-up. These services are independent. They do not have to be delivered sequentially, and all providers do not have to deliver all services. But the telephonic triage and response is the entry point into the behavioral health crisis system. It may result in the resolution of the crisis over the phone, a referral to mobile crisis team, a referral to 911, or an active rescue. It consists of interviews, assessments for the determination of the type of response. Next slide. Mobile crisis response is face-to-face. -face. Some referrals are made by clinicians, family members, friends, housing providers, clinicians, um, and the individual receiving services may not always be receptive to the intervention. But currently, mobile providers make every effort to make contact with the individual and the capacity to provide initial and ongoing assessment is a critical activity. Involvement of the individual support system has ident been identified by our consumers as critical to the resolution of their crisis and stabilization. Identification of an existing safety plan or the creation of a safety plan by mobile teams and or follow-up services is considered a best practice. Some teams have access to psychiatric consultation and intervention, but it is not required. The ability to access and link to stabilization centers, crisis residences, community providers, or higher, lo higher levels of care is critical for the ongoing stabilization and support for individuals in crisis. Telephonic and mobile crisis follow-up services are also part of this benefit and can be reimbursed up to 14 days after a qualifying crisis episode. This service was designed and included in this benefit to provide an extended amount of time for connection for the, indi for the individual to the next levels of care, whether it's a community organization, treatment, or support services. We believe it's important for individuals to stay connected when they're vulnerable, and this extended amount of time will allow providers to make telephone calls, have conversations, and make connections for the individual. Next slide. Mobile crisis services have standards that we are expecting all providers to follow. Mobile crisis services must be delivered in a person-centered way. That would include cultural and linguistic competence and understanding trauma-sensitive interactions and interventions. Services should be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And these services should be provided upon request by the individual immediately or within three hours of need. We understand that these services are not available at all these times, but this is the standard that the state would like to meet. Um, we, will, we will work with local government units, providers to help increase hours of operation in, in collaboration with the county crisis response um, plans that have been provided to us by the local government units. Okay, 
Um, and we also understand that providers uh, will not always have the ability to meet the three-hour response time because of barriers such as geography, workforce issues, and we are, we are also willing to discuss and work on solutions to these, these barriers. Slide number 10. Um, mobile crisis services are provided by a mix of licensed and unlicensed or qualified or certified providers. These, um, the services that can be delivered by these providers are delineated in the benefit and billing guidance that's located on our crisis intervention page on the OMH website. So for instance, mobile crisis response can be delivered by a licensed provider individually, a licensed provider and an unlicensed or peer, uh, for example. Follow-up services can be provided by an, a licensed staff by themselves or an unlicensed or, or peer by themselves. Um, naloxone training is required for all mobile teams and recommended trainings for mobile crisis providers are um, listed in our program guidance that's also located on the OMH crisis intervention website. All right, our next section will address our most frequent question, how do we get insurance information when someone is in crisis? And Chris Smith will walk us through this section. Thank you, uh, next slide please. Uh, so, just for some background, uh, as I'm sure most of you are uh, on this call are aware, uh, historically mobile crisis services have either been provided through CPEP-based teams or through grant-funded, uh, community-funded uh, programs uh, in the community. And uh, so most of those grant-funded programs have never really been able to bill uh, for mobile crisis uh, uh, services before. And while CPEP-based providers have been able to bill, uh, we uh, are aware that there are many challenges uh, for CPEPs to be able to bill for these services. Um, so uh, our focus is going to be on some of the pragmatics uh, around how to gather information, both uh, more compliance issues as well as uh, clinical uh, issues. Uh, to lead it off, uh, as Denise and I were preparing this webinar, we thought it would be helpful to have uh, the voice uh, of an experienced provider who actually does this work uh, uh, every day. So we asked uh, Alice Tsao, uh, who's the program manager uh, of the Mount Sinai Beth Israel CPEP-based uh, mobile crisis team. So she's going to walk through uh, the workflows uh, and some of the issues uh, uh, that they uh, uh, have experienced uh, in doing this work. Next slide, please. Thanks, Chris. Um, so what I'm going to do is walk you through our workflow, starting with referral triage. So the process is slightly different depending on the referral source. Internal referrals come from our CPEP mostly, but we also receive them from Mount Sinai outpatient clinics and inpatient psychiatry units. The insurance verification is already done with these internal referrals because the patients have been seen. So it's rare that we don't have this prior to making a visit. From here, we review the patient's history in either the electronic medical record system that we share with the referent or the referral form sent by a department with whom we do not share an EMR. This is important because we might find that the patient has had issues with their insurance and hence their distress and presenting problem in CPEP. So basically any information prior to the visit is helpful so we can follow up on certain things or sensitively broach certain things. Um, next we review psyches. And this is already done by the referent, um, but may not always be documented in their clinical notes. So then we usually check in with the referent if we need additional information or to clarify what we've learned about the patient. With external referrals, um, these come through NYC Well, which is New York City's 24-7 single point of access for mobile crisis teams. The large majority of external referrals are made by providers. Insurance verification um, is off, or insurance information is often included in referrals from NYC Well under the health insurance information section. We then proceed to call the referent and confirm receipt of referral, ascertain risk factors, and talk about environmental safety concerns. 
We also provide general expectations of our services. And then while we have the referent on the phone, we try to confirm the spelling of both the first and last names of the patient, um, ask about any aliases, and also confirm the date of birth. So sometimes a misspelled name might, or a wrong date of birth or an alias that we didn't know about um, could be the reason that we can't find the person in psyches. So then with the confirmed names, date of birth, aliases, we look up the person in psyches. And then we can see their Medicaid ID before even opening the report. Um, to open the report, we select an emergency provision act to access the clinical information. And we consider this important because it's pertinent to our risk factor triage and overall preparedness for the visit. So for example, most recent outpatient services, care coordination, medication, ER visits, these are all helpful for us to reference or explore with a patient on the visit. We also keep in mind that there is a delay in Psyche's updates because this depends on billing submission from providers. So sometimes when we're talking with a patient, maybe they indicate they've been going to an outpatient provider, but we didn't necessarily see this on Psyche's. You know, it's not that they're lying or they're delusional. Maybe it just hasn't been um, updated yet. So what do we do when we have a busy day and we're out in the field and a new referral comes in? We communicate with our program assistant who sits in the office, she doesn't go out on visits, um, and we ask her if she's able to see the patient in e-paces or e-med and get the person's um, Medicaid information. If she is not, she'll let us know and maybe we have to ask the patient um, upon seeing them. But we can also look the patient up in Psyches on our phones because we have an app that allows us to log in remotely. So how do we communicate about patients while we're out in the field? We do this very vaguely, cryptically. Um, we don't use any patient identifiers. We'll say things like the new NYC well referral or the NYC well revisit. We're working on a system that will allow us to um, speak more freely. It's going to be an encrypted system. So the bottom line in all of this referral triage um, process is to collect as much information as possible before going out on the visit. Um, if you have no choice but to ask the patient if they mind sharing their information with you, uh, use your clinical judgment. So ask if the patient is stable and able to engage. Um, ask yourself, have you built sufficient trust throughout the interview? And ask if the patient is low risk of trust being lost if there is a history of chronic paranoid ideation. So a lot of this is using your best judgment in the moment. Asking after the visit is also an option. Maybe you call a collateral that the patient consented to let you outreach and they happen to have the insurance information. So by looking at the referral form, um, checking psyches, using e-paces and e-med, asking the patient and or the collateral for the insurance information, we're usually able to obtain um, the, the insurance information. So I hope this was helpful um, as you prepare to start billing. Um, but I do recognize that there are very, you know, there are differences among agency protocols and resources, patient population. So I hope you can apply what uh, seems relevant, but, you know, disregard what doesn't. Thank you very much, Alice. Um, so we're going to, uh, next slide, please. So some of the information that we included on these uh, next slides is, is redundant with some of the things that Alice already talked uh, about. So we're going to walk through some of these and highlight uh, uh, some of the important issues, uh, but, but this information is also provided uh, for your reference uh, after the fact. So uh, one of the key uh, operational issues that, that uh, we've also heard concerns about uh, is consent. Uh, there's also there's information about consent for, uh, to share information, but one of the key issues is also consent uh, for treatment. We wanted to emphasize that written consent for treatment is not required uh, to bill uh, managed, uh, Medicaid managed care crisis intervention benefit. Uh, and uh, the rest of uh, this slide is really highlighting some of the, the uh, areas that Alice already covered uh, with the uh, idea that if you do a good job uh, of uh, doing your background work before you uh, uh, go out on the visit, Checking your electronic systems, checking with the referent, uh, checking with family members uh, if you're calling uh, to, to schedule the visit or to get other information. Uh, for the most part, you'll be able to get the information about uh, insurance billing uh, in advance. 
Next slide, please. Now, in addition to these sort of pragmatic uh, considerations, there's also clinical considerations. Uh, we've heard from numerous providers that, that uh, often their staff voice uh, concerns uh, from a philosophical or kind of clinical uh, perspective. Uh, when an individual is in distress, it's not feasible to obtain the insurance information. When you're going out and seeing somebody who didn't uh, necessarily call and ask for this visit, uh, it can be awkward uh, uh, to collect uh, uh, this insurance information. Um, so I, th I think Alice addressed uh, some of these already. I think the key point is really to choose your moment. We would certainly agree that if a person is in, in extreme uh, distress, you're not going to open the visit by saying, can I uh, have your, your Medicaid card? You know, you work with them, you help uh, uh, stabilize the initial uh, uh, crisis, uh, and then, you know, you, you choose your moment uh, to, to ask uh, for the information if you weren't already uh, able to, to get it in advance. And again, as she mentioned, if you can't get it on the first visit, if you haven't been able to get it in advance and you're still not able to get it on the first visit, you can also uh, ask for the information during follow-up uh, calls uh, or visits or from, again, family members or, or other supports. Uh, another thing I think it's important uh, to consider is I think asking for this kind of information normalizes uh, this type of a visit. Uh, this is not, you know, some, uh, it is strangers coming into a person's home uh, uh, and asking intrusive questions, but it's in the context of uh, a, a clinical service, uh, a, a service provided by an institution, by an agency in the community, by a hospital. Uh, to, to try and help uh, uh, an individual. And so I think uh, that, that having that, that context in mind that you are providing this really essential service uh, and, and that it's important uh, to be able to, to bill for the service like any other uh, clinical service you'd be providing. Next slide, please. We wanted to walk through some of the information uh, around psyches uh, and the use of psyches uh, in, in this work. So uh, you do have to uh, uh, can have some way of consent for obtaining consent uh, in order to, to use psyches uh, to access the full psyches record. The standard uh, approach for psyches is to have a person sign a, a consent form. Uh, and that allows you to access the full uh, clinical information. And then when you're going in, you have to attest uh, within Psyches to the process uh, that, that you used uh, to gain consent, whether the person signed the consent uh, or whether you're using the emergency uh, protocol, uh, which uh, Alice referred to. Um, Alice, quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, have you, well, actually, I'll hold off until we get to the uh, emergency uh, section, and we'll go through that, and then I have a question for you about that. Um, so the Psyche's consent is a two-page consent form. Uh, the person has to sign uh, uh, the form, and then you document uh, that that's your, your method uh, when you're accessing the person's record. Next slide. The other way that we think is also going to be very uh, helpful uh, for mobile crisis teams is there's uh, you can access a person's uh, full record uh, in case of an emergency without uh, obtaining consent. Psyches refers to this as breaking the glass. So again, you have to document uh, th that you're uh, using this method within the Psyches record, and you have to identify what clinical emergency allows you to use this feature. You can't just use it uh, uh, whenever you feel like it. You have to, it has to be clearly in an, in an emergency. Uh, and you have to document what the emergency is, that safety concerns for the individual or someone else uh, uh, are present. Uh, but by uh, documenting this, uh, it allows you to have full access to the person's uh, a clinical record, uh, but only for a time-limited period. I believe it's a 72-hour uh, uh, time period. And again, uh, as Alice mentioned, you know, verifying the person's name, date of birth, uh, uh, you need to, you know, make sure that you have their proper spelling because there are many people with very similar names. As Chris Smith, I can personally uh, identify uh, with that. Now, what I wanted to ask Alice is, uh, in your work, have you always uh, had, uh, has, of all of the referrals that you've gotten, 
been seemed like uh, a sufficient crisis to be able to enable you to use uh, uh, the emergency uh, uh, yes pathway yes absolutely um, so I can't remember a single referral that came through NYC well that we didn't question how urgent the situation was based on providers clearly indicating that the patient that they just saw um, you know, a week ago seemed to look like they were decompensating, they've been lost to follow-up, um, they present to be exhibiting signs of a departure from baseline. So I consider that very much a clinical emergency and appropriate for mobile crisis to see the history before going out and having all of that information available to us um, to really ensure the team's safety. Okay. Thank you. So I would recommend that uh, as uh, teams who are uh, beginning to, to start doing this work, and if you haven't already been uh, accessing psyches in this way, to uh, develop a, a local policy and procedure uh, for how you're going to be uh, uh, accessing psyches and, and, and work it out within your own uh, internal agency uh, with your own uh, compliance and, and quality uh, staff. And the other thing about this is depending on, you know, how long you're going to be working with somebody or where you're going with the referral, uh, there might be circumstances when uh, gain getting the, the full consent uh, uh, if you have the opportunity or, or the time uh, uh, to do so might make sense. Uh, if they're going to be uh, continuing within your, your organization, uh, you know, if you get that consent from the, the beginning, then, then you know, uh, it's already present and, and, you know, nobody else within your agency would have to follow up uh, for the same kind of, uh, of consent. Next slide. The other uh, piece that is incredibly important uh, uh, for mobile crisis teams is that Psyches is now uh, has a mobile app uh, for iOS, uh, so you can uh, access uh, a Psyches report either uh, on an iPhone uh, or an iPad. Uh, you can download uh, the app from the uh, Apple Store. It is only for Apple. Uh, there is no uh, Android uh, app at this point. We started with Apple because it had uh, enhanced security features uh, that, that we were uh, uh, comfortable for using, given that we're sharing uh, a significant amount of uh, protected uh, health information. Uh, so, so this app uh, really allows people to, uh, as Alice described, uh, obtain Psyche's information uh, on the go, in the field, uh, it also allows you to even enter uh, uh, some information. Uh, you can access people's safety plans. If, if anyone has uploaded a safety plan within Psyches, uh, you can complete uh, uh, a suicide safety screen uh, in the field uh, using the, the Psyches app. Uh, so while the, the general expectation uh, or is, the, is around Psyches as, as having just this clinical information, it's really evolving uh, in ways that allow it to be much more interactive. Uh, and also, I would strongly encourage uh, anyone who works with somebody if you uh, in a crisis situation and if you develop a crisis plan, uh, I think it would be a very good practice for you to upload the crisis plans that you develop into Psyches so that they're available uh, for uh, other uh, individuals who may uh, have a crisis interaction uh, with the person that you're working with. Uh, in, in the future. So this isn't a Psyches webinar, so uh, there's a lot more we could uh, talk about, uh, about Psyches, about all of these features that, that we're uh, describing. Uh, we would encourage you, if you're uh, interested or if you want to learn more about the consent process, about how to use the mobile app, uh, about how to develop or upload uh, safety plans, uh, Psyches has uh, uh, archived webinars uh, on their site uh, that, that can help you uh, understand uh, these functions better. Next slide. So the other thing I just wanted to mention are the benefits uh, of collecting uh, insurance information. I mean, the obvious uh, uh, benefit is that it helps ensure the sustainability of your program. Uh, but there are other uh, benefits as well. If, if you're linking somebody to care, and you don't know what their insurance is, you're not going to have a good sense of what types of programs they're going to be uh, eligible for. Uh, and and if, you, if somebody is in managed care, then you have access to uh, the care managers uh, within the NCO who can also be a very good resource 
uh, both for helping you uh, understand uh, the person's history, providing clinical information and, and service information uh, about the person, but can also be helpful in providing linkages uh, and referrals uh, to services. It also, uh, in similar uh, ways, uh, gives you an opportunity to uh, educate the person uh, about their benefits uh, and what services uh, they're eligible for uh, related uh, to their insurance. And last, this is a, a benefit I never really thought about or understood until I came to work for OMH. Uh, one of our primary data sources for how we understand how the mental health system works is through claims data. And so if programs are not billing uh, uh, for the services that they provide, we have very little window uh, into what these services look like, who's getting them, uh, what the total cost uh, of a person's care is. Uh, so, so it's very uh, uh, important for us uh, and for you, because then it'll also be uh, in psyches, uh, for instance, uh, later on, uh, uh, to, to bill for the services uh, to help really understand how the system functions. Next slide, please. Uh, the other issue that we wanted to highlight here, it's not strictly related to, to the uh, insurance information we're describing, but just to highlight that uh, state uh, uh, confidentiality law uh, allows providers to share clinical information uh, to provide a referral or linkage uh, to service uh, without uh, consent. So, but, you know, and we, I'm not going to attempt to read the, the legalese on, on the screen, but, um, you know, this is an act, uh, a feature of the New York State uh, mental health uh, system that providers are not always uh, aware of. Uh, however, you should ultimately follow your own agency's local uh, policies and procedures, but if they are very restrictive in areas like this, you might want to bring this up uh, and kind of, because it can really, you know, consent can be both uh, uh, a barrier uh, as well as a, a tool for uh, engagement uh, and, and helping a person understand uh, their care better. Next slide. Okay, I'm going to hand it back off uh, to Denise, uh, who's going to talk about some of the uh, backroom issues and billing issues uh, uh, around the mobile crisis benefit. Thanks, Chris. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone, too, that uh, the mobile crisis intervention benefit uh, is a Medicaid managed care uh, benefit only at this time. It's only for Medicaid managed care enrollees. Um, so for utilization management, that means the management of services, um, particularly with a managed care company, is that mobile crisis services must occur within the context of a potential or actual crisis, and that actual crisis must be able to be documented. Um, there are, we'll talk about documentation in a minute. Um, prior authorization is not required for any mobile crisis service, and it is not subject to utilization review. So that means you do not, do not have to justify um, to the managed care company the billing, but you do have to provide documentation if you are ever um, audited. Next slide. All right, documentation. Documentation is critical um, to these services. You need to complete your documentation within 24 hours of the delivery of the service. The date of the qualifying crisis episode must be included in your documentation, and it should follow the guidelines in program guidance in, um, that's on our OMH crisis intervention website. Next slide. All right, so documentation in support of billing. Um, that would be being able to identify the date of the qualifying crisis episode, a description of the crisis, a description of the services that are provided to the individual and the, the individuals who provide the service. So, for example, for follow-up services, the date of the qualifying, qualifying event that supports the services must be included in your documentation. That gives you the beginning time and then you know what the end time is to complete services. 
um, there is not any restriction on how many services you can provide within those 14 days. Um, the telephonic services are billed in 15 minute and per diem increments. And those telephonic services that are billed in per diem or in 15 minute and per diem increments are the telephonic triage and response. Telephonic follow-up services are only billed in 15 minute increments. In-person services, which means the mobile crisis response service on this slide, are billed in 15 minute increments up to six per day or 90 to 180 minutes or 180 plus minutes, which is a per diem um, billing. The staffing patterns would include a licensed professional, a licensed professional and an unlicensed professional, two licensed professionals, or it could just be an unlicensed, uh, an unlicensed staff or a peer. Next slide. Okay, billing codes. <laughs> Um, rate codes, procedure codes, modifiers, specialty codes, unit types, and unit limits are all provided on the New York State calculated rate sheet. That rate sheet is also available on the OMH Crisis Intervention website. Um, so you should familiarize yourself with those rates and, and codes. No diagnosis is necessary to bill. So if there's no diagnosis, you could use R69, which is an illness unspecified, or the F99, mental health disorder, otherwise unspecified. If there is a diagnosis that you're aware of or that you've given the individual, that can be included as well. But you can't have both diagnosed. <laughs> uh, if the individual licensed practitioner is Medicaid enrollable, they must enroll and use their individual MPI on claims. Locator codes are not necessary for billing these service because this benefit is not available in fee-for-service. Next slide. Billing the managed care plan. All claims must be submitted on the UB04 claim form and uh, MCTAC website, and there's a link included on this slide has an interactive UB04 claim form that describes each section of the claim form if you have questions. I believe there are also um, billing webinars available on the MCTAC website. Uh, providers must submit claims within 90 days of a service being rendered to be compliant with Medicaid timely filing. Now, some of our mobile crisis providers were approved prior to the October 1st implementation date. Um, those providers may be billing for services prior to October 1st, and those claims should be paid. Next form. Next slide. Resources. So we've included um, resources that could be helpful to you if you have questions or need assistance in, um, in anything related to the mobile crisis. Uh, services under the crisis intervention benefit in Medicaid managed care. So the OMH crisis intervention website includes the benefit and billing guidance, rate sheets, program guidance, and overall descriptions. It also describes um, other elements of the crisis intervention benefit that will be coming in the future. Um, there is a link to the field office, um, OMH field office staff, there is a link to the MCTAC mobile crisis page, which has another webinar that we had providers we had provided for um, the providers earlier, you know, in the year, and then we had additional questions, so we wanted to do this follow-up webinar. Um, the Psyche's web page. Um, this web page has a calendar of webinars that are current, and they're recorded. Um, trainings for all different aspects of Psyches. So there is a training specific to the mobile app. There's a training specific on how to access particular information in Psyches. So this is a, this is a wonderful resource if you want to understand how Psyches works and all the features that are available um, in Psyches. And the Psyches mobile app can be found in the App Store. That's free. Um, and it's it's a, it's a wonderful tool for mobile crisis providers, and it was developed 
specifically for mobile crisis um, and related to this um, around this Medicaid managed care benefit. Next slide. If you want to contact one of us at OMH, you can um, email the crisis initiative mailbox. That was set up for provider approvals um, to build a managed care benefit and for um, county mental health directors and providers just with general questions about program. The managed care billing questions should go to the OMH managed care mailbox and any Psyche's questions can go to the Psyche's help desk. One other, when we finish, when we uh, distribute the slides, we're going to add uh, a link to the McTac matrix, uh, which will provide uh, information to, uh, for direct contacts to all of the managed care, managed Medicaid uh, plans in New York State. So it looks like we have um, some time for questions. Um, so this is May, um, and Denise and Chris, we have a number of questions that have been chatted in. So if it's helpful, I'm, I'm happy to read some of the questions. Um, and if we can answer them, great. If not, and we need to put them in the parking lot to address them later, McTac is happy to help coordinate that as well. Um, but would you be comfortable if I started reading off some of the questions that folks typed in? Sure. Great. So I will do that. And in the meantime, if you have been sitting on a question for the entire webinar, please chat it in. We're going to try and get through as, as much as we can in the time remaining. So our first question, um, it looks like it's, it's addressing the workflow. Um, and this is, I think, for folks who might not be um, based in New York City providing this service. So the question is, um, is one to cover the workflow for people who are referred by first responders or the 24-hour crisis line? And I think to give context to that, the person who asked that question also said, Referrals are, are often going to be the person or family calling, um, not another organization like um, the example that was given in New York City. So I'm wondering, I'm not sure if, if that's clear enough <laughs> for our state partners to answer, um, but that was our first question that we got in. So, so could you repeat, now that you, know, you gave the context, can you just repeat the question yeah. again? So the question was, is one to cover the workflow for people who are referred by first responders or the 24-hour crisis line? I think the point, uh, I think the best point we can make to, to address mm -hmm. that is, is certainly the, the, the system that Alice uh, described that, that we have here in New York City is not necessarily representative of uh, the, the systems for accessing mobile crisis uh, throughout the state. But I think the, the general principles uh, apply around doing the uh, initial triage uh, uh, with whoever uh, made the referral, gaining as much both clinical uh, information as well as demographic uh, uh, information, uh, using that and, and, then, and then going from there. So if you're not, if you don't have an organized uh, crisis line that's making those referrals, you may not have that, that kind of detailed information coming with your referral, but we still think it would make a lot of sense for you to try and do the, the background work in advance, uh, uh, to both for clinical, uh, demographic, and billing uh, reasons. Thanks, Chris. And thanks, Denise, as well. Um, so our next question, um, someone is wondering if there's guidance around mobile crisis being able to look at psyches prior to obtaining consent and prior to seeing the individual. Um, written guidance. I think we discussed um, the ability to access um, psyches data for emergency response and the, the process for that would be to, um, you know, identify what the safety issue is. And I do believe that Psyches would address that in their training specifically. And that would Thanks. be on the Thanks. Psyches website. Yep. yep. Great. Okay. Um, we have another question from someone who's based more out of a rural county. Um, and so their question is, 
can you address the billing issue when non-licensed and licensed agencies coordinate and address the 24-7 um, expectation given low volume? We, yes, we can talk about this. And this is a, this is a, um, a conversation that we've been having quite a bit lately around, you know, the barriers to the delivery of services quickly in rural areas when there is not already a system already, de you know, developed. And that is um, something that we're going to have ongoing conversations with because we don't have an answer to that right now. But, and we also would defer to um, the county mental health directors in their crisis planning about how those agencies work together and how they would like them to work together. And we are willing to work with you around, you know, how to support those, that planning. So I think it really is up to the, the region or the county about how they would like the, right, the crisis response system to look and the identification of those barriers and um, conversations that we're going to have ongoing and, um, and looking at other models across the country for rural um, delivery of mobile services. Great. Thank you, Denise. You're welcome. Um, sorry, Chris, were you going to jump in? I'm sorry. Nope. Okay. All right. So next question. Um, it looks like the question is, does the 14-day clock start from the date of the referral or the date of the first successful face-to-face -face with the individual? Well, I think that would depend on what service you're approved to provide. Okay. If you're only approved to provide telephonic triage and response, it would start from the date of, of your conversation with the individual. If you're only approved to provide the mobile crisis response, it would start from the date that you, you, you go out on the mobile crisis um, call. Yeah, I think in both cases, it's from the date you make the contact with the uh, individual because it, it's, it's intended to be a follow-up from that visit. Right. Okay. Thank you both. Um, so another person chatted in a question about who can bill for crisis intervention service off-site, and there they want to confirm that what was shared in the presentation is that a peer staff member can bill for crisis intervention services provided off-site. Is that correct? Um, the, the provider agency must be approved by the state in order to bill, and it has to be part of the county response plan. Um, if that provider is, um, employs a peer to do follow-up services, then, um, you know, I'm going to have to look at the rate sheet. I do believe that a peer can provide services off-site in the community because it's mobile crisis follow-up provided by a peer. And a peer can certainly participate with a licensed provider for both initial uh, uh, and follow-up uh, services, uh, right? So, the, Denise, it's that a peer couldn't – a licensed uh, uh, individual must do the initial uh, uh, visit, but they can do it in concert with a peer. Isn't that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Or an All unlicensed right. Uh, uh, right. staff. Right, right, or an unlicensed staff. This is outlined pretty clearly in our guidance document, so we would recommend that you take a look uh, there. Thank you. We'll refer people back to that. Um, okay, so let's see. Our next, the next question, um, this is, it sounds like someone who had been, so can you say more about billing for services prior to 10-1 if your agency was providing such services earlier than 10-1 um, that are still only 90 days back. All right. I, um, I would prefer to talk about that with the provider directly. So okay. if the provider wanted to contact me either by my email or the crisis intervention mailbox, I, I think we could talk about that then. Great. Thank you. Great. Um, there's another question. Let's see. Can the same client be billed more than once per day? if multiple telephonic triage interventions are provided? There are, there's a unit limit for how many um, 
how much telephonic triage you can do per day, um, and you could look at that in the rate sheet. Okay, thank you. Let's see here. Just give me a moment. We've gotten a lot more questions, so I'm trying to. I'm pick sure. Them up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing some questions. I might not be looking at the right chat, chat box about children's services and about yeah. you know, other plans yep. uh, other than managed care and a concern that, that there's a lot of kids who aren't in, in Medicaid managed care. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think it would be helpful to, to comment a little bit on, on this. So we, we're not talking about the new CFTSS service crisis intervention. This This is specific to the 1115 demonstration benefit uh, that, that has gone through the pathway that, that uh, uh, Denise described. And so uh, if you're a CFTSS provider, the billing information we discussed doesn't really apply to you. The pragmatics, the clinical information, we think you might want to, to kind of consider. But, but we're, this is not, uh, we're not talking about billing uh, uh, for, for CFTSS. And we will Thanks. be providing guidance for that in the future. And there was a question about commercial insurance and duals. Mm -hmm. Duals are not eligible uh, under this benefit. It's currently a managed uh, Medicaid benefit only. Uh, commercial plans, if you can, we, if, if you can negotiate a, a rate uh, 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 with a commercial plan, we would uh, encourage you to, to do so. Uh, and, and in the future, we're looking to bring crisis intervention services, all of these new crisis intervention services, uh, under a, a state plan uh, amendment, uh, which will broaden their, their billing beyond uh, just managed, uh, managed Medicaid, uh, kind of in parallel with what's happening on the children's side, but that's not available yet. And Thank I you, would Craig. recommend if a, you know, if an individual that you serve has commercial insurance, you can reach out to that commercial insurance company to talk to them about referrals or services, um, that, that's something that, that can be done. Thank you. And just to say, we have um, quite a few questions still, so we're going to keep trying to answer some, but I think what would make the most sense um, is also for us to kind of turn these questions into a que uh, frequently asked questions document, like we've done for some of our webinars in the past for MCTAC. So MCTAC is happy to work with the state on that. I just want to acknowledge that for folks who chatted in questions that we might not get to, we are collecting them all, and we will do our best to follow up after the webinar um, with some responses to those. So just wanted to say that because I'm looking at a whole list of questions, and I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get to them. <laughs> um, Great. Thanks, Meg. Yeah, of course. So our, our next questions are kind of around um, the telephonic piece and billing. Um, so one, one question is, does this, does mobile crisis, does this benefit allow current crisis centers to bill for most of, if not all of the calls they get on a crisis line that are 15 minutes or longer? If they are approved by the state mm -hmm. um, to bill for this benefit and they can bill for these services if the enrollee has Medicaid managed care. Thank you. And if the calls meet the standards of the service. Right. If they're crisis calls, if they're information and referral calls, just, you know, that I would not say that that's a crisis call, but it could be in the context of a crisis. So you have to use your judgment on whether it's crisis, but your documentation would have to justify that. And most importantly, as Denise mentioned, you'd have to be designated uh, by your uh, LGU to be a, a provider of that service uh, uh, within your uh, county or your region. Thank you both. Um, so again, back to this telephonic piece. We're asking, someone's asking for clarity that if they're handling a call through a 24-hour hot crisis hotline, does the call need to be at least 15 minutes long to be billable? So let's assume this individual is designated as, a benefit, as, as someone who can provide this service. If this call comes in on a 24-hour crisis, 24 crisis line, does the call need to be at least 15 minutes long to be billable? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and let's see. 
see. Okay, so this is just, I guess, asking for clarity around when the telephonic billing benefit can be used. If it's appropriate to be used on follow-up calls to patients and their family members, and what about follow-up calls to other providers? Well, the description of the services that can be provided through telephonic uh, and mobile crisis follow-up are described in the benefit guidance and the program guidance. Um, so I would, I would recommend just familiarizing yourself with, with that. And if there are questions after that, that would be, we'd be happy to um, answer those. Okay. It sounds like um, there's quite a few detailed questions around this telephonic billing piece, so I might reserve some of those. And I think maybe what we can do is pull together in our FAQ like a billing-related um, uh -huh. answer section. Yeah. Um, I but I think Denise's yeah. point is is well taken. Uh, you know, this obviously wasn't a, a webinar to, to get into a detailed look at, at, at all of the ins and outs of, of billing, much of the, and and the services. Uh, a lot of that is outlined uh, in our guidance mm -hmm. document. So we would encourage you to to review those first uh, and follow up uh, after you've uh, uh, reviewed those to, to see if they address your questions directly. Thank you. I think I'm look. I'm just scanning some more. Um, let's see here. Um, just again, can multiple providers uh, provide telephonic triage in the same day for the same individual? If they're approved to provide it by the state. Okay. However, we would be continuity of care and communication would be would be very key. So I, I would have clinical uh, uh, concerns about multiple unrelated providers providing the same service to the same individual uh, in a day. And, and uh, if your system allows for that, you might want to take a look at, at how that would work. And if there are the documentation, it's, if, if uh, providers are talking to each other, that should also be documented. Coordination of care around crisis services, especially, but as with all services, is key. So make sure that that's at play. Absolutely. And our last, I think this will be our last question, just looking at the time. Um, so someone is wondering if initial calls are billable if they are not self-referral. So for instance, when collecting the triage information. Yes, they are. They are. Okay. Well, on that note, I'm going to thank Denise, Alice, and Chris for presenting with us today. Um, I want to thank my colleague Tara, who's running everything in the background, and I want to thank everyone who joined us and asked so many great questions. Um, we did receive a lot, and we were not able to answer all of them. So I think we are going to partner with Chris and Denise to get those answered and um, to circulate kind of a question document that hopefully will clarify some of your your questions that we weren't able to get to today. So I want to just thank everyone and hope everyone has a really great rest of your week and Thanksgiving holiday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.